heavy helicopters impress with their size, weight and capabilities. When they are mentioned, we remember such big guys as the CH-53E or Mi-26, the leaders of our time. But at the height of the Cold War, the Sky saw a machine next to which they look like toys. Hello Aviator Sky here and today we will get acquainted with this monster and try to answer the obvious questions. Is it even a helicopter? How much does it weigh and how could it fly? I present to you a rotary wing building. The Soviet Titan V-12. In the 1950s, the development of aviation in terms of pace was comparable only to the ambitions of aviators. And while jet engines gave speed to aircraft, turboshaft engines gave life to helicopters. Considered exotic with very limited capabilities before that time, with new engines helicopters made a giant leap forward. The engines became more and more efficient and powerful, making them excellent tools for increasing the performance of their rotorcraft hosts. And probably the most striking example of such a leap was the helicopter industry in the USSR. In 1957 the Mi-6 took off for the first time. A 42-ton helicopter with a 35-meter main rotor simply shocked common people with its size and performance. Quite recently something like this was hard to even imagine. For common people. For helicopter engineers, the Mi-6 was just a stepping stone on the path to new achievements. They, like all aviators of that time, rushed forward, being sure that they were able to create almost anything. Not to say that they were completely wrong. The chance to prove it appeared quickly. While aviation engineers were taking their creations to unimaginable levels, the operators of those creations were developing new applications. This of course is primarily about the military, the military of the Cold War. They wanted to be able to quickly transfer troops and equipment to anywhere in the country and the world, and the most obvious way of transportation was by air. First of all of course we are talking about planes. The future An-22 matured within the walls of the Antonov Design Bureau, a turboprop giant the size and capabilities of which removed most of the restrictions on the weight and dimensions of cargo, whether it be a company of soldiers, a tank or a ballistic missile. Their transportation and deployment were a hot topic at the time. But the An-22 nevertheless had limitations. It could deliver anything but not anywhere. It is an airplane, which means it needs airfields. But helicopters do not. The idea arose to create a kind of pair of an airplane and a helicopter. The first would deliver the cargo to the airfield and the second would deliver it to the desired position, while working in close pairs assumed that they should have similar transport capabilities. It sounds nice, but the thought immediately arises. Should the helicopter have transport capabilities similar to the An-22? What kind of helicopter is it supposed to be? The answer was simple. You, dear designers, are ambitious, smart and creative people. So figure it out. And they sure did. Initially in 1961 the customers were more modest. They wanted a helicopter with a carrying capacity of about 20 tons, close in the number of systems to the Mi-6. It had already been worked out and risks could be reduced. But the engineers wanted more. The source of their zeal was the research already being carried out in various design bureaus, which considered ways to create a helicopter with a payload capacity of as much as 40 tons. There were many options. The first, most obvious was the classic one, the main and tail rotor, a kind of giant Mi-6. A logical path, but with such a mass and size there was a risk that one main rotor simply could not master the Colossus. The second option, a tandem layout with two rotors. It made it possible to abandon the tail rotor and increase the size and weight of the helicopter. Quite promising, the sky has already seen such machines as the Yak-24 and H-21 and a few years later the CH-46 Sea Knight and CH-47 Chinook appeared, flying successfully to this day. The Miel Design Bureau, the parents of the Mi-6, had been actively studying this layout since the 1950s. But with all the pros it also had cons, which were getting bigger with the increase in size of the machine. The propellers of such helicopters overlap, 
That is, the planes of their rotation intersect, and if the propellers are very large, they can hit each other, and this is a disaster. Getting rid of such an intersection would require making a helicopter excessively long and pointlessly heavy. In addition, this layout slightly reduces the efficiency of the propellers, and with the huge size of the helicopter, this becomes a tangible problem. It was necessary to look for another solution. And the solution was found. Since the rotors cannot be placed in tandem, they can be placed transverse. This layout is even more exotic for helicopters and did not reach the series. Now it can be found in tilt rotor aircraft, visually similar but conceptually different machines, so they can hardly be used here as a direct example. In any case, the transverse layout was already considered quite viable, albeit rather complicated. Mill eventually chose it. The designing process was carried out at an active pace, but the engineers had to solve a huge number of tasks, some of which the helicopter builders had not previously encountered. Customers who, in search of new applications, constantly changed requirements were not helping either. The result of all this was that by 1965, the V-12 project, although deeply developed, for the most part remained at the level of blueprints. But they were enough to convince the officials to continue the work, and the design bureau received the decision to create a full-fledged experimental machine, with the possibility of subsequent production of a test batch of another five units. By 1967, the first prototype was ready to begin the test program. Well, it's time to look at the result of their work. We are at the Central Air Force Museum in Monina, near Moscow, and in front of us, there it is. Let's start with the main point. The V-12 is a very, very large helicopter. It is 37 meters long, 34.4 meters wide, not including the span of rotors 35 meters in diameter each, and 12.5 meters high. So overall, this thing is the size of a Boeing 737. Meanwhile, the 737 in the 800 version weighs about 80 tons and is light. The building in front of us has a maximum takeoff weight of 105 tons. Comparing ordinary helicopters to the V-12 is simply ridiculous. The modern record holder Mi-26, a huge machine, is twice as light. Its layout is unusual to match. At first glance, average people may not immediately understand what is in front of them. So, the location of the power plant in the V-12 is transverse. Two propulsion units are located not on the fuselage as usual, but on the wingtips. Yes, the V-12 has a wing, moreover of a very unusual shape. From the center section to the tips, it rises and becomes wider. This type ensures safe operation of propellers and the best airflow performance. There are even high-lift devices on the wing. Groups of spoilers and flaps are installed on each console. Part of the internal volume was occupied by fuel tanks, the rest was placed in a pair of external tanks on the sides of the fuselage. Of course the wing itself could not withstand the huge loads, and it had to be reinforced with a metal structure, a kind of external truss set. Aerodynamics suffered a little from this, but there was little choice. Other options were too complex and heavy. The tail of the V-12 is quite intricate for a helicopter. The fin above the fuselage and the horizontal stabilizer. Both have deflectable control surfaces, plus a couple of small fins on the stabilizer tips. With some resemblance to the tail of the An-22, the logic here is a little different, mainly relating to the operation of the control system and size restrictions. This thing is already huge, the last thing it needs is a high fin. The landing gear of the giant is relatively classic. Two legs of the main gear are located under the propellers just at the junction of the tubes, so that when landing, the weight is evenly distributed over the entire structure. The forward swivel leg is located under the nose section of the fuselage. The bogies are two-wheeled, a little smaller in front, a little bigger on the main gear. Huge wheels. The landing gear is non-retractable. There was little sense in it, besides the main gear had nowhere to retract. Now the biggest part. Thanks to the transverse layout of the engines, the fuselage was made practically empty, and it looks more like that of an airplane. Its main part is the cargo compartment, around which, in fact, everything was built from the very beginning. 
The cabin is quite light, it is equipped with windows on both sides. Inside, they are lined up at a human height, but because of the high cabin from the outside, it seems that the helicopter is actually a double decker and the windows above were simply forgotten. Given the concept of unification of cargo performances between the V12 and AN-22, their cabins and loading tools had to be very similar and for the engineers it was a challenge. For all its size, the V-12 could not afford such a huge fuselage as the AN-22, which meant that the helicopter builders had to fit a huge cargo compartment and all its filling into a smaller fuselage. And after all the games with layouts and blueprints, they for the most part succeeded. The cargo compartment has dimensions of 4.4 by 4.4 meters wide and high. Antonov's tradition of making square cabins came as a result to the Mies brainchild. In length, the V-12 cabin reaches 28.15 meters including the ramp, which is only slightly less than the AN-22 cabin. Most of the loading equipment, cranes and winches are also almost the same. This was quite enough to accommodate up to 196 people, an average load of around 20 tons with a maximum load capacity of up to 40 tons and this is an incredible performance. The V-12 could carry most types of civilian and military equipment, including parts of ballistic missiles. The helicopter was superior to most full-fledged military transport aircraft. Loading and unloading was carried out through the tail door, similar to an aircraft but with nuances. When opened, the bottom of the tail section with a ramp lowered and above it a slightly round ceiling swung open, dividing into two large doors. There is also a pair of rigid hydraulic supports which should prevent falling on the tail during loading and unloading. The nose section of the V-12 could not be ordinary. In the nose is the first cockpit, behind it is a small rest area. Above is the second cockpit which you can get into by climbing the stairs. It looks more like a layout of not a helicopter but a military transport aircraft, just in the inverted form. For example, while in the AN-22 the main cockpit was on top and the navigator was sitting below, in the V-12 on the contrary, the pilots, flight engineer and flight electrician were at the bottom and the radio operator and navigator were put on top. This way the pilots were given the best visual control over the situation and the navigator retained the right to have an office with the most gorgeous views from the front and top. His cockpit protrudes slightly forward and has a large window in the ceiling. By the way, everyone has excellent views. The V-12 is a helicopter, it has less speed and drag, so glazing can be made much wider. The huge cockpit looks like a terrace of a country house, stuffed with flight equipment. The equipment for its time was very decent. The helicopter received a duplicated control system with hydraulic boosters, a four-channel autopilot, automatic control of the engine state and propeller rotation, an extremely useful bonus in this position and a fresh radar. But with all this assistance, the crew of course still needed to keep in mind a fairly large number of nuances of controlling a very large and very specific aircraft. The power plant with all the exotic layout was quite conservative. In a sense, we can say that on the wingtips of the V-12, the tops of two Mi-6s were installed. So, it consists of two large blocks, each containing a pair of D25VF turboshaft engines with approximately 6500 horsepower each. These engines for the V-12 were modified and boosted but remained part of the D-25V family, which had already been worked out and quite successfully lifted the large Soviet vehicles, the Mi-6 and Mi-10. Given the already high risks of a breakthrough machine, such conservatism is quite logical. Besides, the future operators also wanted unification, at least in terms of components. Each pair is equipped with its own transmission connected to the main rotors as well as connected to each other by a shaft passing through the wing. This made it possible to synchronize the rotation of the blades and also reduce the risks. In the event of a failure of some of the engines, the blades would continue to rotate and the helicopter was able to, if not fly further, then at least not to roll on its side and crash to the ground. The transverse layout with no fuselage under the engines allowed the engineers to apply an interesting maintenance scheme 
Each block is closed from below by a fairing, which if necessary lowers, opening access to the power plant and serving as a platform for technical personnel at the same time. Very convenient. Ironically the overlap, because of which the helicopter builders initially abandoned the tandem layout, has been preserved here. The two five-blade main rotors are similar to the Mi-6 propellers and have a diameter of 35 meters, which is a lot. With such a size, in order for the dimensions of the helicopter to remain at least within some acceptable limits, the propellers had to be made with an overlap. Minimal and with additional safety solutions, acceptable. But as a result, the noise and vibrations in the fuselage grew from this. They had to put an effort so that this factor would not become a problem. All these exotics were able to lift the helicopter to a ceiling of 3500 meters, which of course is not that much, but for helicopters of that time the figure is not bad at all, and more was not particularly required. Heat and high mountains were hardly considered to be the profile operating zones. Speed is also average, 130 to 140 knots, 240 km per hour cruising with a maximum of 260 km per hour. The practical range reached 500 km, ferry range twice as much, nearly a thousand km. So, all this beauty was supposed to begin flight tests already in 1967, and on July 27, the machine took off for the first time at the airfield in Panki near Moscow. But the first flight was unsuccessful. The V-12 rose to a low altitude but began to sway in the air and made a hard landing. To the luck of the testers and engineers, the giant got off easy, with damage only to the landing gear. The investigation revealed an unusual effect. The control system turned out to be too sensitive. Slight wiggles of the flight sticks in flight were perceived by it as control actions. The control system was immediately modified and the problem was solved, but it took a long time. The first full-fledged and official flight of the V-12 was made on July 10, 1968, and then everything went well. As part of the testing program, of course, many nuances were revealed, and many systems were improved, but overall the helicopter did not change anymore, behaved quite tolerably, was controlled quite well, and was not even particularly noisy, at least inside. The layout turned out to be quite viable, and all thoughts that this building is not capable of taking off were now a thing of the past. The helicopter builders even moved the bar further. While the basic version was being tested in the sky, within the walls of the design bureau the V-12M was already looming, in which four D-25VF engines were to be replaced by two D-30V, the turboshaft version of the large D-30 jet engine. The number of rotors was to be increased to 6, and the carrying capacity and range were to increase even more. Naturally, the flying building could not do without records, which in 1969 followed one after another. Their apogee was the lifting of 31,030 kilograms of cargo to a height of 2,951 meters as well as the lifting of 44,205 kilograms to a height of 2,255 meters, a peak that was conquered only many years later. No need to be jealous, it was beaten by another Mi giant, Mi-26, which in 1982 managed to lift to 2 kilometers as much as 56.7 tons, but that's another story. The Giant's next grand adventure was the 1971 Paris Air Show, the perfect place to show off. The V-12 flew there on its own, and when it got there, it gave industry journalists a ton of topics for articles and high-profile headlines. The helicopter was so huge that there was simply nothing to compare it with in the industry. Everyone had vivid impressions, even among competitors. The Giant received the Sikorsky Award from the American Vertical Flight Society awarded for outstanding achievements in helicopter technology. In parallel by that time, it received the necessary NATO designation, Homer. So perhaps one of the most iconic American animated series has a Soviet trace. By 1973, the second prototype was ready for testing and made its maiden flight. It seemed that the beginning of serial production was not far away. It seemed to engineers. 
The military saw not only outstanding performance, but also potential problems of mass operation. The V-12, for all its merits, was a very complex machine, and its carrying capacity seemed redundant and did not justify itself. The infrastructure was developing, airplanes were handling the transport tasks quite well, and the concept of rapid deployment of ballistic missiles by planes and helicopters had lost its relevance. Now they needed a machine, albeit more modest, but much simpler and cheaper to operate, and the future Mi-26 was supposed to become this machine. As we know, it did, and is still successfully doing its job. But the birth of one legend cost the life of another. In 1974, the V-12 tests were in fact cancelled, and the entire program followed. The project of the improved V-12M, of course, was also immediately closed. It did not go beyond mock-ups. By the way, the V-12 is often called Mi-12, and it should have become one if it was put into service and went into production. But since it did not happen, and the serial Mi-12 never appeared, the giant formally remained at the stage of the V-12 project. The two prototypes, fortunately for the fans, were lucky. The giants were not disposed of or lost, but carefully put into places where they would be given proper respect. The first helicopter, which actually participated in most of the tests, remained on the territory of the Mil Moscow helicopter plant in Tamilina, and the second one stands in front of us at the Central Air Force Museum in Monina. Decades have passed, but it is still there, starring in educational videos. Such is the story of this rotary wing building. This story continues, but now here, on the green grass near Moscow, among other retirees. Like and subscribe to the channel, this Eldorado still has many stories to tell. And if you want to watch the videos early, see some exclusive behind the scenes content or just support the channel, consider joining our Patreon community. Fast flights on interesting planes and helicopters, and soft landings to you.